So <clears throat> I first uh, met a uh, not in person, but strangely enough, uh, after writing uh, the very first blog post on the Make Lab blog, where I used the phrase digital vernacular, which ultimately came the title of my book. But I had never said, I had said it out loud once in front of Ralph Nelson, and he uh, helped me figure out maybe what it meant. And then I wrote a very uh, brief blog post about it. And my blog is fairly well followed, and I would get lots of that's cool and like and things like that uh, as comments. But then this guy uh, writes this like three page response <laughs> in incredible detail uh, about what he thought of my blog post. And I'm like, who the hell is this guy? Uh, and then I looked him up and I found out it was uh, Yod Kamath. And from that, I started following his work. And uh, maybe three years after that, we were both uh, in New Delhi together uh, doing a project which I feel like fell in line with, with some of the ideas I wrote about, but really more influenced by his work uh, in this area. <clears throat> so with that, uh, I'm going to introduce Ayod Kamath and some of the interesting things about him. Uh, Ayod started out his architectural education where he received his bachelor's of architecture at Shashant School uh, of Art and Architecture, and that's in a suburb of New Delhi. Uh, he found his way to Boston at, uh, at MIT, where he received a master's in science in architecture and computational architecture. Uh, he not only is an assistant professor here uh, at Lawrence Tech, but he's also a partner uh, in the architecture firm uh, at Kamath Design Studio in New Delhi, India. And with that, uh, I give you a year, Kamath. Okay, so I've never worn one of these mics before, so just let me know if you can hear me or not hear me. Uh, is this clear? Am I audible at the back? Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Uh, no, so thank you for the introduction. Thank you to the uh, lecture committee and for setting this up. Uh, it was a bit unexpected because this was supposed to be a sort of gallery talk with 10 or 15 people in the brick gallery and then it became this <laughs> la uh, last week. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, so the title of my talk today is Computationally Reclaiming Material and uh, I'm not sure if any of you have had a chance to look at the boards up at the brick gallery because uh, there the title is Digitally Reclaiming Material and then I decided to switch that over and you'll see why as I get into the talk. So I mean and as you can see in this image the talk starts in Detroit and is to do and starts with blight in Detroit and one of the issues with blight in Detroit is that the more the blight there is and the fewer occupied houses there are, the harder it is to provide infrastructure to the houses which are still occupied because of low density and other various other reasons. I mean, uh, that's something I'm, I'm guessing most of us in this room here especially are already familiar with. Uh, so now a popular response to blight is the idea of reclaiming material. And, and uh, what that means is that you take material from abandoned houses and you use that in houses, uh, you use that to build new houses or, in, or to refurbish ex existing houses. But unfortunately, most reclaimed material gets downcycled and what I mean by downcycled is that there's a reduction in the utility and the value of the material when it's reused. Um, let's see. So the reason for this is that while a new house is built out of standardized material, what comes out after when you reclaim material from an abandoned house is material that's been modified and been made non-standard and unpredictable. So what you then need to do is that you need to re-standardize it and before it can be reused. And most of the time this re-standardization process 
means that you have to trim the material, cut it and modify it in other ways which uh, reduce its utility and value. So what was once a house now becomes a countertop, a tabletop or a candle stand. Right? Um, so then, so I, so when I moved to Detroit, one of the quest and learned about material reclamation here, one of the questions I asked myself was, is there a way to upcycle material rather than to downcycle it? Uh, so, and what this might do is that it will enable you to use material from abandoned houses and rather than make candle stands and tabletops, can you then make bus stops, benches, pavilions and infrastructure that's lacking in the city. Uh, so instead of standardizing the standardizing reclaimed material, I started with some uh, fence, non-structural fencing posts and what I did was I removed only those parts which were unusable because I mean the bits that were cracked or had nails or knots in them and so what I was left with was a whole bunch of non-standard pieces of wood and so I just I took a measuring tape and I measured the length breadth height of each of those pieces and recorded that then I experimented with different ways of joining and joining pieces together with tolerances and other things and I decided to build a parabolic arch and a parabolic arch unlike a circular arch has non-standard curvature so what I did was that I matched the variations in the curvature of the arch to variations in the length of pieces so the shorter pieces went where the arch was more curved and the longer pieces went where the arch was flatter and then I also matched the depth of the pieces to the amount of deflection at different points in the arch so at the top there's more deflection so the pieces are deeper at the bottom there's less deflection so the pieces are shallower there and this is what the arch looked like I had a span of about six feet and I think it's about two and a half feet high and so then what I did next was that I designed a grid shell which is basically a set of arches which are intersecting each other at right angles so it's arches going this way and that way uh, so because I was now dealing with lot, a lot more pieces of wood and a lot more arches I converted the simple logic which I had used in my head to build the arch and I converted that into an automated computer algorithm that found that again used uh, length and depth and found the best position for a particular piece in a grid shell based on the curvature of the grid shell and the amount of deflection and then this was how the intersecting arches joined and that's what that's a computer that's a 3d model of what of the analysis and what the grid shell was supposed to look like and this was the actual grid shell which I'm not sure if any of you remember this it was out near the pod uh, last semester so and this was about seven feet wide uh, or six six and a half feet wide six six and a half feet tall so I mean just enough to qualify as a bus shelter for someone of my size or <laughs> or it could be a pavilion in a park or something like that right uh, now each joint because each piece of wood was different and each uh, connection each connection was different and was a result of the algorithm doing its thing then and the joints were all friction fit joints so that the pieces could be easily assembled as well as disassembled so that the pieces could be used for something else which I believe did happen over the summer so it worked uh, so, so now in this, with this structure I was able to upcycle material because the computer algorithm was able to tackle the different size members without needing to standardize them and reduce their utility and value. So the non-structural fencing posts then became, were used to build a, a grid shell structure. 
Uh, now, so the reason I switched the title of my talk from digitally reclaimed material to computationally reclaimed material is because all computation doesn't have to be digital. So computation is not just what happens inside a CPU, or, uh, but it can, ha it's, but computation I mean, uh, to me, simply the manipulation of information. If you're manipulating information, you're computing. So, for example, uh, let's see. Does this play? Okay. Yeah. So here, you see, you see this man weaving a basket from twigs and leaves. And each leaf is different. Each stick in the framework of the basket is different. And he needs to process a lot of information to figure out how exactly to arrange the leaves, where to fix them to the framework and all the other stuff that's going on in this weaving process. Uh, but it's not only the human being that's computing here because if you look at the leaves they are in groups of, they've, they grow in groups of three. Right so let's see does he put yeah there, he, there you go so he's putting this next set of leaves in they grow in groups of three. He's going uh, yeah, there and he's then arranging each of the three leaves as they grow right um, and so how is it that the leaves are always in groups of three that's because the information in the genes of the plant or the tree that gave, that these leaves came from that information was expressed in the growth of the tree in the form of leaves which always occur in groups of three. So in that, in the making of that basket it wasn't just the human but it was also the tree that was computing or processing information, right? So now I'm going to move from humans and plants to insects. So this is a paper wasp which build and these wasps build nests by remove sort of scraping material off plant plant leaves and stems and chewing up that material mixing it with enzymes in their saliva and making a little uh, ball of paper pulp. Then they take that paper pulp in their mouth, they fly to their nest and then they place that paper pulp on their nest to build a nest which looks something like this with sort of nearly identical hexagonal cells. And uh, researchers at Harvard University have studied how wasps and termites build their nests and they've developed robots which build structures in the same way. This is from some years ago, it's not even new. So I'll just play that for a short while. So I mean termites do much the same thing as the wasps instead but just instead of plant material they collect uh, mud and mix that with the enzymes into little bricks so instead so you either have so wasps have balls of paper pulp and the termites have little clay bricks that they make and so yeah so these robots use these in this case you are using these tiles and the thing here is that in the case of the termites and the wasps and these robots, the individual, the individual's building, so the individual wasp, the individual ant, the individual robot doesn't have an idea of the whole that they are building. There's no, each of them doesn't have a little set of construction drawings in their brain. All that they have is a set of simple rules like if I see a brick or a tile or a drop of uh, paper pulp here then what I do is I lay the next one to the right of it so it's something as simple as that I and mean, that's a that's not a real rule it's just a hypothetical rule but something as simple as that and so for example a wasp when wasps are building their hexagonal cells there might be a rule that says that okay if you encounter a wall of a certain length then you start building a new wall at 120 degrees from that Right, so now if the wasp keeps doing that six times, it will get a hexagonal cell automatically. But in the brain of the wasp, there isn't any representation of a hexagon that it needs to build. So, 
and this form of uh, computation that the wasps, the termites and these Harvard robots use is called stigmergic computation and as much as I hate terminology I will I'll just talk about what that involves so the individual stigmergic agents which would be the individual wasp the termite or the robots again the uh, they have only simple behavioral rules in their memory that tells them to respond in fixed ways to specific information in their environment. So like I said, if there's a wall that's X length, then start a new wall 120 degrees from it, right? So, uh, so that's all. So what they do is that, so an agent perceives some information in its environment it acts on that information and processes it in its brain and then it and the output information is put back in the environment through a physical modification of that environment right so if a wasp sees a little blob of paper pulp there it checks back to the rule in its brain and says okay put another uh, ball of paper pulp to the right of that right so it's perceived some information, it's processed that based on a rule and then it's the output of that rule is expressed in the form of a physical modification of the environment. And then you can have, and these agents can act in tandem one after another after another sequentially to perform different steps in a computation. And this iterative process of perception and action is called a perception action loop and it allows uh, and it allows stigmergic agents to collaboratively compute without the need to exchange information through language or any other f direct form so I, f I find information in the environment I process it, I act on the environment and the next agent comes along or it could be me in the future when I've already forgotten what I've done which happens often and right, and then that s new agent perceives that information, processes it, further modifies the environment and it keeps going that way. Right, but in a, but, and that's not as weird as you think because if you look at it at a fundamental level as I'm talking to you now I'm doing precisely that because what am I doing? I'm modifying the pressure of the air in front of me with my mouth and that environmental modification is being perceived by your ears in the form of your eardrums vibrating and then that's going into your brain, right? So, so in, in some senses any form of information exchange through a medium is a stigmergic sort of exchange. So anyway, so now I'm going to move from wasps and termites to another species of insects which another species of insect that also performs stigmergic computation but with a, but somewhat differently. So this is the nest of a weaver ant. I don't know if you can notice it's all the leaves are kind of bunched together in the middle. That's the nest. And so how the weaver ants build these nests are the teams of worker ants pull and hold together edges of leaves and then they and other workers squeeze the larvae of the colony to stimulate them to produce silk and then they hold these larvae which are squirting out silk like a shuttle between the two leaves and they weave that together to stick them right so compared to the wasps now the ants need to process a lot more information about their environment because so then the ants need to be aware of the size of the leaf the shape its position on the tree how flexible it might be and then it needs to correlate that information with the uh, requirements of the nest which would involve which would include a chamber for the queen chambers for the larvae chambers to store food and then an outer protective layer so there's so there's a lot more in information that these ants are processing compared to the wasps uh, but on the other hand the ants are using much less material 
So in a sense, you can think of the wasps as downcycling the plant material that they use because it's, I mean, there's a perfectly good stem or a leaf. They scrape that off, chew it into a uniform pulp and build uniform hexagonal cells. The ants, on the other hand, are upcycling these leaves because they're using the existing structure and shape and location of the leaf and they're adding only a little bit of silk between the leaves. Right, so from the perspective of the ants, the value and utility of the leaves is going up when they build the nest, right? And they're using much less material in the process. So those of you who were here from at, at last week's talk will recognize this person as David Pai, and and. And he sort of divided, he classified workmanship into the workmanship of risk and the workmanship of certainty. And uh, applying this to the wasp and the ant, you would call what the wasp does the workmanship of certainty because the material which it's working with is uniform paper pulp. The shapes that it's producing are uniform hexagons. So there's very little risk involved. You know what you're getting, you know what you're using, you know what you're getting. While with the ants, their nest building strategy is far more risky because the ant has no control over the tree and the precise shape of the leaves or their locations or any of that. But it's, so it's, far, it's a far bigger gamble that the ant is taking to build its nest the way it does compared to the wasp. So in the same, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, and uh, yeah, one more thing is that, oh wait, where was I? Sorry, I'm a little lost. Uh, okay, I'll just go straight on, it's fine. I'll, uh, it'll come to me at some point and then I'll probably jump back to that slide. Anyway, so we generally think of ants and wasps and other insects as these automatons which are following pre-programmed genetic behavioral rules. So, but can there be a creativity in stigmergic processes? And according to this man, who is Jürgen Schmidhuber, he's a Swiss-German computer scientist, it is possible. And and it and it becomes possible for a stigmergic agent to be creative if it is able to modify the rules of its own behavior right so according to schmidt huber uh, okay i'll just read out this so creativity according to schmidt huber is the desire and the ability of an agent to improve its own internal model of the environment to better predict the results of its actions so think of this as, uh, okay, to borrow Professor Adhya's example of a child learning to walk. Uh, as a child is learning to walk or, as, or learning to cycle or anything, it, as, it, as it does the action again and again, it's better able to predict what will happen when it moves its body in a certain way, right? So as it's able to better predict the outcomes of its actions, it's able to learn and more of its behavior is predictable and it's less risky. Now moving back to the diagrams, uh, the action of a stigmergic agent will have some effects on the environment that the agent is able to predict and some effects that the agent is not able to predict. So the predictable ones are environment P, the environmental effects which are predictable, and environment U are the effects which are unpredictable. Right? But uh, an agent in a stigmergic process can learn about these unpredictable actions by perceiving the effect on the environment. So even if it, so for example, if I crumple up my notes here and I throw them there, I'm not 100% sure where they're going to land, right? Beforehand, I don't know. So that's an unpredictable outcome of my action. But then once I've thrown it and it's landed somewhere, then I can walk up there, find it, and then I know where the crumpled up notes fell, right? 
So in my second step of stigma G, I can, by perceiving the result of my previously unpredictable action, I then know what I've done, right? So now, so creativity and learning come in when, if I throw my notes enough times, and I find where they land, I will then know, I'll then have a bet, much better idea of how, how much force to throw it with, and so if I don't like someone's face in the audience, I can then aim and throw and I hit them, right? So that is, so if I'm able to do that, that is creative, that then I'm learning about and I'm being able to better predict the results of my actions. So once again, I'm, uh, this diagram collapses the previous steps into a single one. And right, so while the wasp is not able to perceive as much information in its, but in its environment the, as the ant, instead what the wasp d does is it modifies its environment to better match its simplistic inner, internal model of the environment. So the wasp's internal model of the environment is relatively simple uh, because it only has to, it mostly has to deal with uniform lumps of paper pulp. And the wasp's internal model of the environment doesn't include the shape of leaves, the size of leaves, the position of leaves, their flexibility, none of that stuff. So instead, what the wasp does is that it modifies the environment to match its internal model, right? And the strategies of the wasp and the ant are much like the strategies of conventional material reclamation and computational reclamation. So, I mean, uh, so the wasp chews up the paper into uniform little drop paper pulp drops and here you reclaim material, chop it up into uniform blocks. The ant perceives all the, the various, uh, perceives a lot more information in the environment and similarly and is able to compute all that information and similarly you can, I, I mean you can measure pieces of wood and put those into an algorithm which then processes that information and creates an output. So, but unlike insects, humans can and can can and do learn and modify their behavior in real time without having to wait multiple generations. So, because and, and what I mean by that is that a wasp or an ant, uh, a wasp or an ant's behavior is pre-programmed into the genes. So, the only way that it can modify that is if it reproduces the genes, it swaps genes and there is a new set of genes in the next generation and therefore there are new forms of behavior in the next generation, right? That's the only way that a wasp or an ant can learn. But humans don't have to wait multiple generations. We have a brain which, can process, which is more flexible, which can process more information. So we can learn in real time. So if I throw this paper enough times within this talk, I will, be a, I will have better aim at the end. I don't have to wait for my grandchildren to be better throwers. Right? So anyway, so this is a family of the Baiga tribe in central India building a house. So as you can see, the house is made up of branches and twigs. The points where the tree branches or forks are where the beams rest on columns. So the builders of this house have to perceive or have to record this information about the tree and cut a specific tree based on the way it's branching, its size, its shape, and then use that to build the house. Right? So this diagram sort of shows you all the various stigmagic agents and the flows of material and information that take place to build that house. So for example, uh, Baigas pra uh, practice a form of shifting agriculture and forest stewardship called bewar cultivation where patches of forest are cleared for, and for a few seasons of cultivation and then allowed to regenerate. So, and it's from these forests that the trees would be harvested. Then the tree itself has its own genome, it has other uh, symbiotic organisms in the forest, it has sunlight, carbon dioxide, water, uh, nutrients, oxygen, uh, and various, and then it photosynthesizes, it, it throws out oxygen, and in the process it grows. Now, 
so that's the tree. Then a bill, then a, the builder of the house sort of walks, goes into the forest. It finds this tree which is grown in a specific way. They they uh, perceive the form and the shape and the size of that tree. Then they and they choose a specific tree. Then they cut it down. Then they uh, may strip the bark off the tree. Then put it in the ground and sort of build their house right so these are all the steps that go into create in steps of information processing that go into building that house so um, but so in order to learn to build a house a baiga in, uh, individual would develop skills over their lifetime and creatively respond to their environment right so and through the workmanship of risk so so this is uh, so yeah. So this is the same as the earlier diagram I showed. I just swapped agent for craftsman and craftsperson. Sorry, right? And yeah, that. And but but uh, but humans, unlike insects, can actually exchange information directly with, and talk to each other and write things down, make drawings, and all of that. So where so so when humans do that or when individuals in a society begin to exchange information this this develops into a technology which is nothing but a set of shared skills and that's what uh, in technology kind of boils down to and i didn't say that it, this was said by uh, a french philosopher whose name i can't pronounce uh, right so so the diagram on the left there uh, collapses the individuals who make up a society into one entity which is the, is the society the whole society and you can see just as the individual uh, members of that society are individually performing stigmatic computations the society as a whole can also be thought to be involved in a stigmatic computation where it is creatively where the technology of that society is cre evolving to better suit its environment mm, yeah so the diagram on the left collapse that those three circles in the middle you get the diagram on the right and the diagram on the right matches this previous diagram down here right same shape same shape same process now that was craft so now let's move to design and industrial production now compared to the baiga house which is made out of varied unpredictable material this house made from dimensional lumber involves the workmanship of certainty you know a two by six is a two by six. okay no two by six is not actually two inches by six inches but gen you get the idea <laughs> right uh, so now because design and construction are separate activities here the framer has has to follow the construction documents and building codes and has little room for creative risk taking on the job so and in order to facilitate this the framer has to be provided with lumber of standardized dimensions just like the just like the wasp is uses standardized drops of paper pulp yeah so so yeah so the comparison between the dimensional lumber house and the non-dimensional timber house is again similar to the wasp and the ant or conventional rec material reclamation and the computational reclamation now uh, this is herbert simon a no nobel laureate and that's a book by him called the sciences of the artificial and in that book he talks about how in industrialized societies one can divide disciplines into natural sciences which study the natural world like physics chemistry and biology and artificial sciences which study human made phenomena like engineering which studies machines architecture which studies buildings and law which studies law that kind of thing so in an industrial society the actions of the worker are dictated by information generated by scientists engineers and designers at the level of the individual worker the workers actions have no feedback mechanism to affect the information that they are mandated to follow 
right? So if I'm sitting there nailing two by fours on a building site, I have no way of changing the uh, international building code, right? But if I'm a Baiga tribal building my house, if something doesn't feel right to me or if I get an idea or think of a way of doing something better, I can just immediately do that. Right? That so and I can take risks, my idea may work, it may not work. Right? Uh, mm, okay, so Right, so the, so the workers in an industrial society are not really stigmagic agents because they can't respond to information in their environment. They're forced to respond to information which is given to them by other people in, the, in their society. So, and similarly, the in industrial society, so, yeah, so this is industrial society as a whole, that is the workmanship of certainty where these prescriptive codes in the form of design codes and the design that is produced by an architect is what the workman on site follows. Not, I mean, there is some, there is some amount of perception and action with respect to materials. So, I mean, you, if, I, I mean, as I, I don't have the skills or the knowledge to frame a house. So I couldn't do this, so there is skill involved, but that's relatively less compared to wh what you could do. Uh, and similar, oh sorry, and then if you look at the diagram on the top, that is this diagram with all the individuals in an industrial society collapsed together. Now here again, that is not stigmagic because while the scientists who are gathering information are gathering information about the natural world, the actions of industry are what is classified as the artificial world, right? So scientists are and and the and the and uh, to illustrate that, uh, scientists are far less likely to, to listen to engineers or architects while architects and engineers are far more likely to listen to what scientists say or discover, right? So, yeah. But these two people argue that the division between the natural world and the artificial world is a false one. So this is uh, Professor Eugene Stormer and Paul Kreutzen, who also has a Nobel Prize, and anyway, these they coined and popularized the term Anthropocene, which describes the industrial era as being one where human actions influence the natural world in significant ways, such as by converting large reserves of hydrocarbons in the ground into carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, or by releasing CFCs to deplete the ozone layer. Right? So they argue that the division between the natural and the artificial isn't there isn't a division and that the actions of people affect the natural world so it is one thing and if you if we in the diagram if we then unite natural and artificial environments into a single anthropocenic environment which is environment a then society again becomes stigmagic because it is this because you are immediately uh, because society as a whole is reacting to whatever it's doing to the environment directly which is something we need to do now with climate change and not enough oil and that kind of stuff so however in this the individual worker is still not a stigmatic agent because regardless of global warming and floods and the next apocalypse, on site I still need to follow the construction drawings and the building codes, right? <laughs> so the next thing is, are there alternative ways of manipulating information and material in the world? So. I, I would argue that the project that I started this talk with displays one alternative where the design responds directly to information in the material environment. So, so this is 
a diagram of all the steps which went into making that grid shell. Uh, I'm wondering if I should talk you through it or I, I don't even know. Is it, is it even clear and legible at the back? No. Okay. So then, yeah. Okay. There are a lot of steps there. Uh, yeah. uh, but a far more powerful example of an alternative is the fab tree hab, which was uh, uh, how, uh, house proposed by Mitchell Jockum. I, I don't know the way his website tells you how to pronounce it. I couldn't figure even that. Joachim. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so he and he was in, and his him and his firm were in the critical practice studio over the summer, which I unfortunately was not there for. But anyway, so in this Fab Prehab project, basically what happens is that it involves designing digitally fabricated form work, which you use to shape the growth of a tree into a house, and the on, and the only of, and then for the internal walls you just build mud walls because that's anyway protected from the element so you do, it doesn't have to be water resistant or anything particularly water resistant or anything so so if you draw a diagram of what's going on there then the various agents so the tree the human the various human agents the environment the scientist the designer everyone is sort of mutually exchanging information to create this house. And so this information, f the way information material flows here is very different from, let's say, uh, this, where information and ma material flows, but uh, information doesn't flow because you're standardizing material from your environment. So again, this is the wasp. And this is, oh, sorry. Uh, last slide. That is the ant. So, yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you. That's, any questions? So, uh, we have time for questions. Are there any ant advocates? <laughs> yes. Well, I, I may have missed something. I probably did. Um, but it's interesting that you're talking about wasps and ants because I, I uh, was thinking of this uh, quote of Marx where he talks about uh, ants are, are like weavers and Bees are like architects, but, but uh, what separates the best of ants from, from the worst of architects is that the architect has a vision of what they want to do. I mean, it's an exact quote, mm -hmm. does in fact use ants and, uh, okay. mm -hmm. and architects as, as part of the, the quote, and it's um, that they both you know, take natural material and translate it into something else. But what separates them is that humans, uh, through that act, realize their own purpose. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I'm missing from the project is, it seems so positivistic, and it seems so much based on you know, so formative with a capital P, and I'm just wondering where, for instance, when you make an arch out of this, um, or make structures out of reclaimed material, where is the, the purpose that might be embedded in that material, that's mm -hmm. one thing, that built the house based on all these economies and issues of domesticity, and so then when you take it and translate it, it seems to me that you're maybe ridding it of that history. Mm -hmm. that purpose that the material originally had mm -hmm. in some ways, culturally. Does that make any sense? No. Mm -hmm. I completely I get the question and I'm actually glad you asked that because that's something I didn't touch on here and that's that aspect of design is not something I'm very good at dealing with in words myself. But I wonder if 
so I mean if you if one looks at this table to reclaim table top then a lot of oh, oh sorry I'm not on oops oh god now I'm the first sorry uh, where, um, right so if you look at this reclaim table top here there is some there I would argue that there is information embedded in that material about the, inha the habitation of that house over however many years it was inhabited all the people and if where you nailed a specific picture where of a relative who may have passed away and there's all and there's or when there was a fire which was put out in time or any and there's or whatever happened to the house after it was abandoned as it decayed all that information is embedded in that material right but in this tabletop I would argue that that all that information all that history is trivialized because it's not being used it's just sitting there as a tabletop whereas in in here I may not be recording all that information but in the form of the 161, 1612 into 24 into 242 into 22 millimeters, that number is representative of that history because that number came from the way it was used. And that those sets of numbers and that information goes into creating the specific place where a particular piece of wood was went into that grid shell and the role that it's performing structurally functionally in there so I don't know if that helps to answer that in some way but and if you then look at So if you look at, okay, this diagram isn't legible, but I can, oh no, I can kind of, I'll, okay, I'll have to carry my laptop. Oh, no, that's, uh, oh, okay, wait, I, okay, there, this work, oh, sorry, uh, function F4, duplicate, boom. Ah, okay, now I have a cursor, good. So, so over he so this is the framer who's put together the house out of dimensional lumber this is the specific this is the house this is the usage and the decay of that house and that information from that is going into the is being processed by the reclaimer so so when i'm reclaiming a piece of material i am I have to specifically remove it where it had been nailed or or chop off the part a part of it which where there was a knot which the original framer at the time for original framing it was okay but then it's kind of the knots loosened out it's popped out and there's a gaping hole in my piece of wood I need to respond to all those things and so all that information is preserved in the making of something like this and in the making of something like this it's even more apparent because the growth of the tree and the the house that somebody wants to live in their their goals are sort of converging in into one and they're collaborating with each other so I don't know if that makes much sense because yeah, this is these are aspects which I'm not very good at expressing I don't know, does that, did I get the question at all? <laughs> or did I go off on a tangent, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question had a couple of things. Okay. Uh, correct? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so in the, in the first project that you started with the, the parabolic dome, uh, all those pieces that you had, did you have to manually choose where those pieces went and then <laughs> no. did the calculations, or you just put it all the information mm -hmm. at once and your script manually told you which piece is best in which position? Uh, the second one. Okay. The second one. So I had an Excel sheet with length, breadth, height, which which formed the input for 
for the script and then the script decide based on the the algorithm it decided which piece was best to place to air in that and was there thing. a limit to did it use all the pieces or did it only use the ones that uh, figured was best uh, it only used the ones which were best. I mean, I, that, that, that's one thing. Uh, it, I could, I tested it with like smaller and smaller numbers of pieces, and I mean, and the algorithm, and I didn't program the algorithm in like in enough depth for it to tell me that okay, look, this cannot be done. I mean, the poor thing would sit there and try and piece together something. <laughs> And the only time it would stop is if it ran out of pieces completely. But, but I mean, that's not something that is isn't possible. To, you can program that in, I suppose. I, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. Sorry. So, first of all, compliment. Uh, really, something I'm rather complicated. Uh, and and also your focus uh, of the work, I, I, I greatly appreciate. It seems for the time that you uh, developed an argument around upcycling being attached to structure, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that when you measure a piece of wood, because wood's structural capacity is very much attached to its its, its size, mm -hmm. right? Every, everything is like this. Are you anticipating moving forward that ideas of cladding or which is not the same measure right? mm -hmm. that, that all of a sudden dimensions mm -hmm. complemented by other elements? Right. Well, that ideas of cladding, keep the grain off, pulling a body off, or right. other things that a bus stop does, those mm -hmm. things would be similarly positioned. Yes. And so would you envision that the structure would maintain its kind of place at the top of the heap uh, in, in the hierarchy, mm -hmm. or how would you choreograph the relationship? Mm -hmm. Like where, where there's, it's a piece of wood that's ideal for structure and for cladding, for right. example, two algorithms like fighting mm -hmm. uh, for this chunk of wood or something. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, that's a great question, and actually the algorithm which I wrote doesn't care what the shape is, it just puts shape it matches length to curvature, and so the structural aspect of this of this was actually something that I did independently in different structural software, and I f and I calculated one surface, the surface of the shell or the grid shell, and then a deflected surface if there's load applied on it. I gave my s algorithm just the two surfaces and said, okay, now jam wood in between these two surfaces as best as possible. So I could theoretically have given it any random non-structural shape that of my choice and it would have done the same thing. So in this, it w in this particular case it was my personal choice to match the attributes of the wood to structural performance but it could as easily have been an expressive sculptural shape which responded formally or aesthetically to a specific context and it and I could also extend that to other um, issues of sh creating shelter like you said throwing off rain view or uh, protection from wind any any other thing uh, and yes that should that should be possible and that would n need for like, and you'd need to basically set up what your rules are, program them, and execute that. It's not. This is the structural aspect of this is purely my personal choice. In this case, and oh, sorry, go ahead. What do you think is the hardest part about like upcycling materials? Ah, uh, no. Okay, one, the toughest part here in this project was that because each piece of wood was chosen by the algorithm to fit in a specific place, if something happened to that piece of wood while cutting it, if it cracked, if it chipped, if it snapped, then I had to find a replacement which wouldn't be as efficient, right? So each piece was so unlike in a brick wall, if one brick isn't right, or if it breaks while you're building your wall, you can just swap it out with another piece of, another brick. Here, I couldn't do that, and that is something that, I guess, I'm not sure if it's just a mindset change that I need, or if there's some way to better improve that. So what, so and a couple of, and 
more than a couple of pieces actually did snap and break here. So what I then did was that I manually sifted through my uh, the pile of wood in, and I chose the one with the closest dimensions and used that instead. Yeah, so I just sifted through here and which, which is why it's ordered in size so I could find an alternative piece easily. So for me that was the hardest thing to kind of get to grips with because material becomes that much more valuable if it has a unique spot in it in the thing that you're designing. So okay. So in the case of the ants, they they optimize their so the right leaves and the right and the number of foliage and they make their nest. And then once that hatchery is you know, successfully um, raised over to bats, what happens? Do they use that site over and over again or do they go on mm -hmm. and find another site? That's a great question. My only association with this species of ant was for a high school biology project, and I d and that did not go into that much depth. I <coughs> and the, my only association with the wasps is that I've been stung by them, so it's even less. But but that's a great question, and I don't. And that's and that's. I mean, if and the the one. Etym uh, entomologist, sorry, etymology is word origins, entomology is right, insects. So the only entomologist who are like all my information about these ants comes from the famous Harvard entomologist, uh, Edward, Edward O. Wilson, who had, I mean, the, from his early career, then later he had sociobiology and all of that stuff, which became a little crazy. So. The other question is, is that if the uh, some of these leaves is fairly benign, and then mm -hmm. this part of the tree is able to return or never, ah, oh, okay, and right, and the and the um, mm -hmm. continuous participant in the larger system, mm -hmm. that's really terrific. So ah, right. it's mm -hmm. done a number of things, right. but it's never like unlike the wasp where mm -hmm. they take that cell as material mm -hmm. and remove it from the context. Mm -hmm. It serves their purposes because the ants right. or the wasps are right. supposed to right. preserve their new genetic line and you know, mm -hmm. pass their mark and stuff. But the, the nest is it's a dead end. Right. So your particular interest in taking the structural function of the wood and giving it a further mm -hmm. nest structural material mm -hmm. um, is like a continuation of its mm -hmm. of its process. You know, we, mm -hmm. we cut down the tree. We did okay. that. Right. We can't reverse that. So the uh, continued life, I guess, in the system. How long do you push them? Mm -hmm. If you're following it, uh, Okay, so that, I do know a study about these ants on that where somebody <coughs> me measured the, the efficiency of photosynthesis of the leaves which were used for a nest. Mm -hmm. And the life of the nest in, in the case of the ants is as long as the leaves are stuck to the tree. As soon as the leaves are shed, then the nest falls off, and that's and then that's the end of that nest. And what and I think what that study found was that the efficiency reduces of the leaves involved in a nest or incorporated into a nest drops from 100 to about 70 percent or something like that. And that if I if I remember right, the study was inconclusive about the life of the leaves being stuck to the branch and it, they weren't I don't think it said they weren't sure yet if it shed faster or not yeah oh. I'm going to be selfish and ask the last question uh, mm -hmm. and it's an easy one because I think it's mostly observational on your part in one of the diag diagrams where you uh, were discussing uh, the craft society Mm -hmm. The larger craft society that then supports, let's say, for instance, uh, the, uh, the home building <coughs> in India. When you take that understanding of a craft society that encircles craft persons, where do you see that falling in your own reclamation of a Detroit home? So mm -hmm. we clearly fall within an industrialized city, maybe one that mm -hmm. isn't highly functioning. But it is certainly an industrial city. So um, after you you did it yourself, 
where do you see this possibly going in, uh, with that craft society program? Mm -hmm. Uh, so actually, the people who reclaim material from houses uh, need to undergo spe specialized training to be able to salvage material with minimum harm. And one in the, uh, I forget, the Detroit Blight report, Removal Report, sorry, I forget what it's called exactly. Uh, sorry. Oh no, this is in my new laptop. It has nothing on it, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, the Bl yeah, Detroit Blight Removal Task Force report from 2014, one of the uh, advantages or benefits of reclaiming material was that it created skilled jobs for people in the city. So that would form definitely a, an Im <coughs> that is an important part that is recognized uh, important part of reclaiming material which is recognized and that's actually a good question I should look at this okay this diagram isn't legible to you so I'll but but those arrows here which go from the reclaimer to technology are sort of indicative of that aspect of reclaiming materials where they need to undergo spe specialized training and it's a specialized skill in that larger industrialized society. And also the crafts society might have to receive the same type of training from the computationals, or at least it needs to be automated in such a way. Mm. Is that what I'm saying? I'm not exactly right. Because obviously material, but then you have to use the computation to maximize it to upcycle it. Mm -hmm. So there's a... Oh, okay, right. There's kind of a, a specialized there as well. Mm -hmm. so I don't know how that ultimately translates right. to a larger mm -hmm. kind of culture. Right. I mean in this diagram I just burdened the designer with doing <laughs> that. <laughs> but yeah, but uh, that's arguably, I mean that that is that a s new skill which designers in general need to be trained with or not is, I mean that's, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. That was great. Uh, oh, the diagrams? Yeah. Uh, AutoCAD.